Chapter 25 of Astronomy The Science of the Heavenly Bodies by David Todd The sun and observing it as lord of day king of the heavens mankind in the ancient world adored the sun by their researches into the epoch of the Assyrians Hittite Phoenicians and other early people now passed from earth Archaeologists have unearthed many monuments that evidence the veneration in which the early peoples who inhabited Egypt and Asia Minor many thousand years ago held the sun. A striking example is found in the architecture of early Egyptian temples on the lintels of which are carved representations of the winged globe. or the winged solar disk is a bare possibility that the winds of the globe were suggested by a type of solar corona as glimpsed by the ancients little knew they about the distance and size of the sun but the effects of his light and heat upon all vegetal and animal life were obvious to them doubtless this formed the basis for their worship of the sun Occasional huge spots must have been visible to the naked eye and the sun's corona was seen at rare intervals. Plutarch and Philostratus describe it very much as we see it today. How completely dependent mankind is upon the sun and its powerful radiations only the science of the present day can tell us. By means of the sun's heat The forests of early geologic ages were enabled to wrest carbon from the atmosphere and store it in forms later converted by nature's chemistry into peat and coal. Through processes but imperfectly understood, the varying forms of vegetable life are empowered to conserve from air and soil nitrogen and other substances suitable for and essential to the life maintenance of animal creatures breezes that bring rain and purify the air the energy of water held under storage in stream and dam and fall trade winds facilitating commerce between the continents oceanic currents modifying coastal climates the violence of tornado typhoon and water spout together with other manifestations of natural forces all can be traced back to their origin in the tremendous heating power of the solar rays in everything material the sun is our constant and bountiful benefactor if his light and heat were withdrawn practically every form of human activity on this planet would come to an early end How far away is the sun? What is the size of the sun? These are questions that astronomers of the present day can answer with accuracy. So closely do they know the sun's distance that it is employed as their yardstick of the sky or unit of celestial measurement. Many methods have been utilized in ascertaining the distance of the sun. and the remarkable agreement among them all is very extraordinary some of them depend upon pure geometry and the basic measure which we make from the earth is not the distance of the sun directly but we find out how far away venus is during a transit of venus for example or how far away mars is or some of the asteroids are at their closer oppositions then it is possible to calculate how far away the sun is because one measurement of distance in the solar system affords us the scale on which the whole structure is built but perhaps the simplest method of getting the sun's distance is by the velocity of light 186300 miles a second from eclipses of jupiter's moons we know that light takes 8 minutes 20 seconds to pass from sun to earth 
so that the sun's distance is the simple product of the two or 93 millions of miles once this fundamental unit is established we have a firm basis on which to build up our knowledge of the distances the sizes and motions of the heavenly bodies especially those that comprise the solar system we can at once ascertain the size of the sun which we do by measuring the angle which it feels that is the sun's apparent diameter finding this to be something over a half a degree in arc the processes of elementary trigonometry tell us that the sun's globe is 865000 miles in diameter for nearly a century this has been accurately measured with the greatest care and diameters taken in every direction are found to be equal and invariably the same so we conclude that the sun is a perfect sphere and so far as our instruments can inform us its actual diameter is not subject to appreciable change the vastness of the sun's volume commands our attention as his diameter is 110 times that of the earth his mere size or volume is 110 into 110 into 110 or 1300000 times that of the earth because the volumes of spheres are in proportion as the cube of their diameters if the materials that compose the sun were as heavy as those that make up the earth it would take 1300000 earths to weigh as much as the sun does but by a method which we need not detail here the sun's actual weight or mass is found to be only 300000 more nearly 330000 times greater than the earth's so we must infer that bulk for bulk the component materials of the sun are about 1/4 lighter than those of the earth that is about 1 and 1/2 times as dense as water to look at this in another way it is known that a body falling freely toward the earth from outer space would acquire a speed of 7 miles a second whereas if it were to fall toward the sun instead the velocity would be 383 miles a second on reaching its surface if all the other bodies of the solar system that is the earth and moon all the planets and their satellites the comets and all were to be fused together in a single globe it would weigh only 1750th as much as the sun does at the surface however the disproportion of gravity is not so great because of the sun's vast size it is only about 28 times greater on the sun than on the earth and instead of a body falling 16 feet the first second as here it would fall 444 feet there pendulums of clocks on the sun would swing 5 times for every tick here and an athlete's running a high jump would be scaled down to 3 inches let us next inquire into the amount of sun's light and heat and the enormously high temperature of a body whose heat is so intense even at the vast distance at which we are from it the intensity of its brightness is such that we have no artificial source of light that we can readily compare it with in the sky the next object in brightness is the full moon but that gives less than the half millionth part as much light as the sun the standard candle used in physics gives so little light in comparison that we have to use an enormous number to express the quantity of light that the sun gives a spark candle burning 120 grains hourly is the standard 
and if we compare this with the sun when overhead and allow for the light absorbed by the atmosphere we get the number 1575 with 24 ciphers following it to express the candle power of the sun's light if we interpose the intense calcium light or an electric arc light between the eye and the sun those artificial sources will look like black spots on the disk indeed the sun is nearly four times brighter than the crater or brightest part of the electric arc the late professor langley at a steel works in pennsylvania once compared direct sunlight with the dazzling stream of molten metal from the bessemer converter but bright as it was sunlight was found to be 5000 times brighter equally enormous is the heat of the sun our intensest sources of artificial heat do not exceed 4000 degrees fahrenheit but the temperature at the sun's surface is probably not less than 16000 degrees fahrenheit One square meter of heat surface radiates enough heat to generate 100,000 horsepower continuously. At a vast distance of 93 millions of miles, the sun's heat received by the earth is still powerful enough to melt annually a layer of ice on the earth more than 100 feet in thickness. If the solar heat that strikes the deck of a tropical steamship could be fully utilized in propelling it, the speed would reach at least 10 knots. Many attempts have been made in tropical and subtropical climates to utilize the sun's heat directly for power. And Ericsson in Sweden, Maucott in France, and Schumann in Egypt have built successful and efficient solar engines necessary intermission of their power at night as well as on cloudy days will preclude their industrial introduction until present fuels have advanced very greatly in cost all regions of the sun's disk radiate heat uniformly own atmosphere absorbs so much that we should receive 1.7 times more heat if it were removed so far as is known solar light and heat are radiated equally in all directions so that only a very minute fraction of the total amount ever reaches the earth it is 1/2200 millionth part of the whole indeed all the planets and other bodies of the solar system together receive only one 100 millionth part the vast remainder is so far as we know effectively wasted it is transformed but what becomes of it and whether it ever reappears in any other form we cannot see how is this inconceivably vast output of energy maintained practically invariable throughout the centuries many theories have been advanced but only one has received nearly universal assent that of secular contraction of the sun's huge mass upon itself shrinkage means evolution of heat and it is found by calculation that if the sun were to contract its diameter by shrinking only 250 feet per year the entire output of solar heat might thus be accounted for so distant is the sun and so slow this rate of contraction that centuries must elapse before we could verify the theory by actual measurements meanwhile the progress of physical research on the structure and elemental properties of matter has brought to light the existence of highly active internal forces which are doubtless intimately concerned in the enormous output of radiant energy though the mechanism of its maintenance 
is as yet known only in part but from many years observations of the solar constant at washington on mount wilson and in algeria finds certain evidence of fluctuation in the solar heat received by the earth it cannot be a local phenomenon due to the disturbances in our atmosphere but must originate in causes entirely extraneous to the earth interposition of meteoric dust might conceivably account for it but there is sufficient evidence to show that the changes must be attributed to the sun itself the sun then is a variable star and it has not only a period connected with the periodicity of the sun spots but also an irregular non periodic variation during a cycle of a week or 10 days though sometimes longer and occasioning irregular fluctuations of 2 to 10% of the total radiation radiation is found to increase with the spottedness attempts have been made on the basis of the contraction theory to find out the past history of the sun and to predict its future probably 20 to 50 millions of years in the past represents the life of the sun much as it is at present and if solar radiation in the future is maintained substantially as now the sun will have shrunk to one half its present diameter in the next 5 million years so far then as heat and light from the sun are concerned the sun may continue to support life on the earth not to exceed 10 million years in the future but the sun's own existence independently of the orbs of the system dependent upon it might continue for indefinite millions of eons before it would ever become a cold dead globe indeed in the present state of science we cannot be sure that it is destined to reach that condition within calculable time a few words on observing the sun an object much neglected by amateurs on account of the intense light a very slight degree of optical power is sufficient indeed a piece of window glass smoked in a candle flame with uniform graduation from end to end will be found worth while in a beginner's daily observation of the sun the glass should be smoked densely enough at one end so that the sunlight as seen through it will not dazzle the eye on the clearest days at the other end of the glass the degree of smoke film should not be quite so dense so that the sun can be examined on hazy foggy or partly cloudy days an occasional naked eye spot will reward the patient observer if a small spy glass opera glass or field glass is at hand excellent views of the sun may be had by mounting the glass so that it can be held steadily pointed on the sun and then viewing the disk by projection on a white card or sheet of paper care must be taken to get a good focus on the projected image and then the faculi or whitish spots or modeling nearer the sun's edge will usually be well seen by moving the card farther away from the eye piece a larger disk may be obtained in effect a higher degree of magnification but care must be used not to increase it too much keep direct sunlight outside the tube from falling on the card where the image is being examined This is conveniently done by cutting a large hole the size of the brass cell of the object glass through a sheet of corrugated straw board and slipping this on over the cell in this way the spots on the sun can be examined with ease and safety to the eye for large instruments a special type of eyepiece is provided known as helioscope 
which disposes of the intense heat rays that are harmful to the eye frequent examination of the eye piece should be made and the eye piece cooled if necessary that part of the sun surface under observation is known as the photosphere that is the part which radiates light if the atmosphere admits the use of high magnifying powers the structure of the photosphere will be found more and more interesting the higher the power employed it is an irregularly mottled surface showing a species of rice grain structure under fairly high magnification these grains are grouped irregularly and are about 500 miles across under fine conditions of vision they may be subdivided into granules the faculae or white spots are sometimes elevations above the general solar level they have occasionally been seen projecting outside the limb or edge of the disc end of chapter 25